Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Dunster. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second uh, lecture sponsored by Redland, Redland Bricks and Redland Roof Tiles. And before getting to the main part of this evening's business, um, I'd like to introduce Peter Johnson, whose name this year I think I've got right, <coughs> to say a few words about the sponsoring for which we at the RIBA are uh, really deeply grateful. Peter. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, can I also say good evening, ladies and gentlemen? As David said, last year was the first of these lectures where we were very honored to have Michael Graves talk to us. And those of you who are here will probably remember that I asked if you'd tell me and my colleagues whether it had been a good idea and whether we should do it again. Well, the response to that question was, was pretty large, and it was universally yes, it was a good idea. I think all of those who are here found it a most stimulating and enjoyable evening. And the request was that we should do it again. And we in Redland were very pleased not only to do it again in London, but uh, delighted that Stanley Teigman gave a lecture yesterday evening as well in Birmingham. And from all the reports I've had there, I look forward with you to an extremely exciting presentation and talk this evening. It's a good time to do this. It's an exciting time in our industry. It's probably a time of greater optimism about the future of building in this country, that it has a, a, a good future in quantity and very particularly in quality. People are far more concerned about the quality of the design in which they live, the quality of the materials they use. And that really is why we in Redland Bricks and Redland Roof Tiles do feel so pleased to be able to sponsor an event such as this. But to do so, we need three parties. And to each of these three parties, I want to extend on behalf of all my colleagues in Redland our thanks. Firstly, to Stanley Teigman. It is a great honor for us to have such a distinguished speaker. So thank you very much for enabling this, uh, us to give this event. Secondly, through you, David, to the RIBA. It's, uh, again, fine to be able to host an event in, in such super premises. And thirdly, of course, to you. And I thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you very much indeed. So, to introduce Stanley, can I refer you to the <coughs> um, order of service on your seat? And we could now have a moment's silence while you read it. But <coughs> I suggest you probably do that after. You've come here to hear Stanley and not to hear me. And all I can say, really, about him is that mm, Chicago, I think, has always been my favorite city in America. I don't know why. I think it was the first city I ever went to there, probably. And it's always seemed to me to be central. And it's always seemed to be central to those good things uh, that one looks to uh, in America. By which I mean things like, when somebody in Chicago is rude to you, they're not like New Yorkers. They really mean it. Um, this evening, I gather we will be seeing some of Stanley's work. I should warn you that he is carrying a book with him. This is the second of the books which he's actually written, I think. The first, which he regards as, as rather a joke, but I take quite seriously, is called Versus. The second book is called The Architecture of Exile. And I think it's particularly fitting that perhaps we should, at this point in, in the history of the RIBA, at any rate, begin to look abroad and begin to look at ourselves, perhaps, as in some senses exiles, and to find out what that means. And I think that Stanley tonight will probably, but he said he may not, refer to that, that notion. Stanley Tigerman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, David uh, spent some years in Chicago, and we became fast friends early on. Um, his crack about Chicago insult, Chicagoans insulting people is actually something that you all probably see uh, and, uh, as well. It's, it, it's a subject called sincerity, <clears throat> um, which is often joked about. And Chicagoans are sincere. It does make them vulnerable. Um, 
I'm going to show slides of my work like every architect does, but I've broken it into four parts. The first part are some 16 slides, which I'll do very quickly, of buildings and projects I've worked on through the quarter century that I've been in practice. Um, the second part, which is the largest part of it, which is all of my current work, which obviously one dwells upon and one shows because that's how one makes oneself vulnerable and also demonstrates that aspect of sincerity. And the third part is also very brief, are all these little objects and other things beyond architecture, apart from architecture, that I design. Um, I have a practice of about uh, 17 people in Chicago. It's about twi twice as large as it's ever been. Um, I don't much like that. I am much happier if it's one digit uh, in number. I'm not an insatiable type. I prefer not to get too much work. So I don't join clubs. I don't market. I try to alienate as many people. I meet at cocktail parties. <laughs> Uh, etc. Um, David mentioned the book. Of course, the book was supposed to be here, but Rizzoli being Rizzoli, like the number 75 bus coming down the hill in Rome, sometimes go on, goes on strike by itself. Um, and so the book isn't here. Um, I feel very much in exile in Chicago. It's not really what the book is about, but the book, which is not about my work, um, does inform a lot of the work that is shown here. Uh, in exile, meaning uh, Chicago has always been very suspicious of ideas. They are also suspicious of people who talk a lot. Um, so ask Alvin Boyarsky, he'll tell you how, how he didn't get on very well in Chicago. Um, but then again, he may not get along well in London. I don't know. Um, Chicago is a place that is basically antagonistic to ideas. It's a, it's a city made up largely of middle Europeans and blacks who work for a living and who are sincere and who revel in the notion of work. Um, and after having, though I was born there, having been educated elsewhere, coming back from the East Coast to Chicago to live out my life, um, it was extremely difficult uh, because I talked too much and I had the misfortune of reading too much and in any case was antagonistic to a kind of status quo that I've always felt about Chicago. This work is work of a very confused nature, which is the, it is not the work of a focus or of an evolving um, point of view to the degree that it infects the work and makes it understandable and cohesive. The work is anything but cohesive. Um, and the largest part of this, of these slides, which is the recent work in the last four years, which is the time it's taken me to write this book, um, is work where I have been struggling unsuccessfully, as you'll see, with the problem of representation versus abstraction. You know very well the forthcoming show at the Museum of Modern Art on, called The Deconstructivist. In fact, I see that Jenks, the, the author of the Book of the Month Club, um, has come out with something on deconstruction in AD just now. Um, the, there has been a lingering and now growing debate between architects of a stripe who look toward the past to, for verification. Uh, which can be seen pejoratively as a dissimulative stance, and then architects who uh, are the product of uh, influence caused by reading and juxtaposition to post uh, French, French post-structuralist thinkers. Um, and that debate is reaching a, a kind of pitch right now, uh, certainly in the United States. I expect so here as well. Um, so this work, that I'm going to show you, of course, engages in both because I have probably on the downside been able to distance myself from work by using it as a vehicle to learn, which is probably not the most honorable way to conduct oneself. Um, but on the upside, 
it is an attitude of mind that I've had from the beginning as uh, being interested in analysis uh, as opposed to uh, using buildings as a device by which you convey correctness and propriety. So I'm going to, having said that, run through these early slides pretty quickly. Could I have the lights, please? Thanks much. I started my practice uh, in 1962 after having come back from Yale. Um, and uh, like many young men and women who begin, began exercising in terms of geometry and form. And since the world of megastructures and mega ideas were at work at that time, uh, you can see the kind of influence and the uh, concern of a person in their very young 30s just beginning. What's interesting is, these, somebody said after last night's talk in Birmingham, that it's interesting that I've managed to do just the reverse of normal, rational adult careers, is to start with big projects and end up with itsy bitsy ones, as you'll see. And I guess it's to some degree true. In any case, also at that time, very early on, I worked on uh, five polytechnic institutes in Bangladesh, in five jungle villages. Uh, the, uh, did a, 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 a Benedictine monastery, uh, was absorbed in the culture of the day in terms of its machine aesthetic, which I think that to some degree obviously comes out of those fascinations with geometry. Did a house that on the left in addition to, the to another house on the right. Uh, did a building on the left, a 28-story apartment block in Chicago, which is in a way my homage to Mies van der Rohe, um, because it is a Miesian city. By that I mean, of course, after the city burned down, uh, uh, it was a proto Miesian city. Uh, uh, the, the, the Jenny-esque first Chicago school infected a city which had no memory then and only a grid, the Spanish 100 by 100 meter grid, and all of the buildings of Mies, neo Miesians, descendants, psychophants, terminally boring, terrible architects. All that aside, that is the context of Chicago. I then did a second one for the same developer and became a little ironic and superimposed on another grid, on, on in fact, that grid, uh, that giant order. Um, did buildings like a library for the blind and the Humane Society building in Chicago, both of which um, uh, were done at a period where I was involved very much and very interested in metaphor. Uh, did my share of suburban villas for suburban Jewish American princesses. Uh, the one on the left is actually different from the one on the right. They're two different buildings. Um, did, together with my wife, the firm's name is Tiger and McCurry, she's McCurry. Uh, we did our little weekend house on the right, and this building for a, a remodeling of a building in Houston for Knoll International, the furni furniture manufacturer, um, uh, about the same time. And then I became very interested in language. And to, to be very specific and unapologetic, the classical language, in the sense that I had never been trained that way when I was a student under Paul Rudolph at Yale in the late 50s and early 60s. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to, to try to learn something. And so we had this opportunity to do the Hard Rock Cafe in Chicago, which of course started here in London. Of course, we had no cars sticking out of it. Um, and because it had begun in London and because it was in a part of Chicago which had been the subject of urban renewal, a, a large sector of land north of uh, the Loop just uh, is owned by the American Medical Association, I decided to do it contextually with the building that I really admired, which is the one next door to it, or to the left of this plan. Uh, and that building, which is our utility company's, uh, one of its major power stations, the Commonwealth Edison Company, had uh, a building standing next to this, which uh, uh, was done in 1929 by a very famous old Chicago firm named Holliburton Root. And it had always been a favorite of mine, a sort of depression uh, uh, in influenced, flattened classicism with, uh, uh, that was vaguely Tuscan. And so I decided to, 
to continue that in spirit and in fact to line up the various registrations and so forth and do this building for the Hard Rock Cafe. And so it was built. Um, interestingly enough, what I didn't know is that for the past 10 years, this is the building that I admired, you can just see to the l right of the slide on the left, the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, I, didn't re I thought this building was an operating substation. Um, in fact, it had been scheduled for demolition and for replacement by a much larger building, which I didn't realize, and so much for contextualism as a rationalization for the use of language. Um, in any case, before, as I found out about it, I had found out that there was also a competition to do this larger building, and I was then recommended to be sort of a late entry to that competition and won it. So I became obligated thereby to do a building that would respond to the building I had designed, which had been designed to respond to the Commonwealth Edison building. So now I was obligated to do a second classical building, but this one much more canonically correct than the first in order to make the first appear even vaguely reasonable. Um, and what's interesting is that the second, well, maybe I can do it better by uh, showing a model slide of it, um, that the second, the first building is a building which is a very reduced notion about classical architecture and in fact is done in dissimulative materials. There's a product in the United States called Drive It, which is a plastic version of stucco. So it's a building that is dissimulative all the way around, and it's inhab but it's inhabited by people, such as they are at the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, this building is the only authentic building I've ever done. That is to say, it's made out of uh, the, the, the probably, I hope Redland makes as good a brick as this. Um, it's the perfect FBX, FBX dimensionally stable brick, um, uh, through the wall limestone, bronze, etc. But there's no people in it. It's just machines. So it's interesting about contextualism and uh, uh, the classical language. This is another example, but in a somewhat more sincere way, um, of contextualism. We were asked to add on to a, a house, a very large, fairly banal, neo-Georgian um, residence in the suburbs of Chicago. These people came to us and asked to add on a pool. And the building, which is really not very good at all, I mean, ultimately, there's two ways to address these things, if you're going to do them. One is to make a joke of the first one, or to uh, develop a dialogue with the first one, or the other is to attempt to make the first one even look better, even though it's not very good. And I adopted, rightly or wrongly, the latter course. So this is the, on the right is our building, the left is the old house. That's the long elevation of this indoor pool. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, the old house popping through at a certain point, which is actually this piece right here. Um, in this lap pool. But even then, there's a certain uneasiness on the author's part by virtue of his use of um, trompe l'oeil in combination with real materials. So as if a suggestion of ambiguity is the way one might think about reading such work. That is, the pilasters are trompe l'oeil uh, to look like marble, but it's real tile of uh, 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 varying kinds and so forth. But the tradition, the Chicago tradition of, of building well, of being concerned about detailing, still took over and I uh, managed to overcome what other uh, 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 queasy feelings I might have had about the dissimulative quali uh, uh, qualities of the work. This is another example in London of the King's Cross project. Uh, the competition, which we were a part of the team that included Norman Foster, Skidmore, Rings, and Merrill, um, ourselves. We worked on this portion, Frank Gehry, and the landscape architect, Laurie Olin. Uh, so I'm going to show just the slides 
of the sector that we worked on and this particular building that we also worked on. Um, obviously, this is no, no context is there. Uh, this is the one building. The intention is to establish a context, and frankly, with respect to the housing sector, which is the part that, oh, and David Chipperfield was the other architect, I'm terribly sorry, the, that the David Chipperfield and I worked on, David worked ultimately on this building, and we worked on the housing sector, which is here, was done on the one hand to establish a series of precincts that frankly did uh, uh, look backwards for uh, validation, the typical English square and so forth, but were done uh, in the context that none of us would end up doing that work. That is to say, we have no intention or interest in doing this sector. The idea was that we perhaps might end up with one or two buildings, Frank might end up with one or two buildings, and these would be parsed out to younger British architects. That's the intention. I don't know where this project stands. Maybe you do. Um, but these are slides of the of the crescent portion of the various different uh, uh, mansion blocks, et cetera, that we worked on. This was the crescent, um, and uh, this was the mansion block, and then a, a canal defining that center festival island where the Regent's Canal goes, flows to the south of it, uh, where Frank Gehry predominantly worked on, though I must say we all worked on the, the master plan generally, generally together. Um, the, so this is the mansion block stuff, and these are the uh, drawings that uh, SOM had made from them. These were the typical uh, um, uh, housing with uh, uh, shopping below, and these are the drawings of those. Another example, and, and the beginning of a, how the, my dissatisfaction with representation began to manifest itself in my work. Um, there is something in American architecture which um, makes it a kind of a hybrid, because there are no originals, one once said. In America, America quickly looked to finding, as in postmodernism, its origins, whereas in Europe, there never has been a concern because it's flooded with originals. One only has to look out the window, you see St. Paul's, et, et cetera, et cetera. In the United States, there are no originals, a very young country. And the continuing search for a country largely made up of exiles, in a way, um, for its origins, nonetheless attempts to hybridize those origins and to, or water it down, depending on your view, um, and to take buildings that are not literal, but to sublimate the literalness in a kind of hybridization, the attempt to make a better flower, however the conceit may end up. Um, this is an example of a, a butterfly house. Obviously, you all know about Edward Pryor's butterfly house called The Barn that was done at the turn of the century. Obviously, I do too. Um, and so did my client, who is a novelist who lives in an apartment opposite the Guggenheim in New York. And this is her country house. And I was, both she and I, I don't mean to take credit for that in a way, both understood the butterfly house in a very peculiar way as a part of, as, as a building in nature, not as a figural solid. That is, of a building because of its bro being broken into two parts, the reading of its primary and secondary axes um, intersect at points in nature, which then makes the house something removed and pushed back into nature. Also because it produces, like all of the Renaissance villas, the concavity that thrusts a house back, that makes it step back and lets the person enjoy the position of prominence um, in the passion play about life. Uh, those are things that both she and I took as meaning from prior. These were early sketches of that house. It's in Washington, Connecticut, a pre-revolutionary war section of Connecticut near Litchfield uh, on a 10-acre piece of land which we then cleaved um, L.A., actually napalmed these L.A., um, to create uh, vistas that define territorially the edge of the property. It's halfway down a 100-foot slope. Um, this is the plan. So that it was also, I understood it in a perverse way as well, 
that you come in and there's nothing because it's just an eight-foot piece and you're in and out and looking down to the Bantam River and that you have to move diagonally before you can then reorient yourself axially. So there's a series of, of subtle moves possible in a plan like that. And I think that, uh, I think Pryor understood that very well. And then using the devices of, of exaggeration of the standard elements, crickets, downspouts, gutters, etc., to, to engage in local symmetries of the, of the building itself were what motivated it. The model, So in all cases, the issues of concavity have always interested me. Of, I am, as, the, as you'll see in this work, because of the disillusionment of, of all of this, I am less interested in architecture than I was at the beginning and more interested in how it thrusts itself back almost into a state of absence, how it disappears in a way than I am in, the, in making it present, in the prominence, in the predominance of its presence. This is another example. It's house very similar, obviously. A um, little different. Uh, just finished. Don't have the slides of the, of the building. Uh, but it's a kind of butterfly plan, only a much exaggerated centerpiece or drum. Uh, also, a much reduced in language even than the other one. Uh, a sort of his and hers garage that forms a courtyard in front. Um, and the axis, as it goes through and across the river and into the trees. It's a beautiful whitewater creek and a screen porch and a hot tub on the other side. Um, and so that's a view of it laterally. And the plan with, um, that you don't finally get into, the actual entrance to the house is, is back here. So you have to go through that and all of that, and then this is still outside in that space. And then you enter the drum and either go up or down. Kitchen is there, the sort of great hall is there. Conventional bedrooms, master bedroom above, the tower room, and an overlook into that. It's a very simple house. Um, and it's been built as you see it. I have no slides, it's not yet photographed. But that's what it looks like from across the creek on the left and on the right-hand side uh, from the road. Um, but this business of attempting, even while these buildings are all symmetrical and biomorphic to the degree that one axis predominates like the body, um, they begin to fragment, they begin to pull apart. There's a conscious intention of, while using the past, um, to reduce its literalness and at the same time hack away at it in several ways, as you'll see in some projects coming up. Okay, this is another example of to try dramatically to make something symmetrical, whole, uh, a nine square piece. Um, one can almost see the Vitruvian figure, I mean, this sort of round piece that sort of intersects it. But then to bisect it entirely in the middle and to treat with every device possible that center, which happens to be inside, as an outside, th thereby removing the constituent remaining features into the conventional binuclear plan of sort of formal, informal parents, children. But the center portion, which is just a great entrance hall leading to these galleries, and an indoor pool connected by uh, using a bridge connecting the living room and the dining room that you go up some steps that is separated from the pool, it's glazed etc. And then marking that cleavage with these two obelisks um, is actually the way in which the literalness of the building is attempted, somewhat bumblingly, um, to get across that, I that I interest of mine of breaking, of, of having the past become present only to break it in turn. So that's the house. It's been built, as you see. Um, and those are the obelisks, of course, and at night. And from the rear, looking to the indoor pool, that's the, the, with this walk, with treed walk, 
that runs round, curving round the house, this piece. Um, and these cloistered areas defining both indoor and outdoor terraced areas, which you see here. And the indoor, the first section that's thought of as outside is that great hall, which with the double stairs and then stairs leading down and through to the pool below, which actually goes down here and into the pool. And the use of conventional windows uh, as if this space was outside, which is more successful in the pool area where we worked with a wonderful trompe l'oeil artist to try to create the feeling of the out, out of doors. The library, which is the room to the left of that great hall, the living room and the a, 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 a little rotunda that leads to the left of that library. And then the pool, which is indoor, which has this bridge which runs over the pool, connecting both the living and the dining room. Uh, again, the ambiguity between the real and the, uh, uh, the use of trompe l'oeil in, in dissimulative ways. This is perhaps a clearer example of a way of presenting a building in its literalness only to break it. It's a building that's now finished. I have no slides of the finished building, but I, I think they're just taking the scaffolding off. It's one of the projects in the uh, Tegel project at EBA in West Berlin, near the airport, that Charles Moore was the principal architect, and a series of other architects, John Haydock, Stern, Portuguese, Grumbach, and I, did little villas, uh, actually six flat apartments, 16 meters on a side, up to a certain point, breaking of roof at, at a consistent angle, but they're all very different, of course. And so what I did um, was to take Mises' uh, first Pearl's house, which is still existing in West Berlin, and use it as a paradigm. Uh, because for me, it's always represented, in a way, in that very early portion of Mies van der Rohe's career, um, a stripped down, very classical, stripped down understanding of, uh, stripped down classical understanding, I should say, of um, uh, the typical middle European Berliner building. Um, which is three bay, etc. And then I broke it into two. The center part, of course, was functionally useful, so to speak, is a winter garden. But the idea of using measurement, which will start to inform my work from this point forward in these slides and in my life, um, in that I believe that measurement is central to an understanding of the, speculating about architecture. So this measurement, which happens to be a cubit, which is about a half meter, the biblical measurement, the measurement from the elbow to the outstretched fingers. And then it forms a sort of scaffold, which is also, as another reading, the idea that the building, which appears reasonably innocent as a typical contextual building of a middle European variety, is actually built on an armature or a scaffold, wondering whether the building is coming up or going down. Um, and that that scaffold becomes the mullionization. So it reads through the building. So as the building appears to be authentic, the building also appears to be very thin because it appears to be on this armature. Um, this is the plan, obviously a six flat. Works very well for that. This is the winter garden section. Uh, in the center and the, uh, and the units. I mean, it's a very simple plan, type. And that's the building in these colors built that way. So it is tripartite, in fact, with a base, a middle, a top. The appearance of columns, they are, of course, merely down, downspouts. Um, this is stucco, or the German variety of stucco. Uh, this is a, 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 a stone. Uh, and a, 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 a copper roof. Um, and then this, the, the scaffolding, which is in red, of course the building is the color of the German flag, it seemed the right thing to do, um, makes the appearance or the reappearance of that scaffold running around the building um, understandable to a degree 
about the impermanence of things. On the other hand, the building on the side is as conventional as I could make it in order to make the point. This is from the back facing the Tegel Basin. And this is the key drawing and, uh, and, and model pulled apart for photography purposes. That the, that the grid, the matrix then, that forms this scaffold is in turn disrupted by the person simply gaining access to their apartments or hanging out on a Sunday afternoon. Of course, it's Lexan clad at the top, so uh, it is actually a very pleasant space. But the idea that, the, that it's a way of measuring the, the, the building, that it is a scaffold, um, that it in turn is disrupted by the person going through it is what informs it. This is another example of, the, of a way in which superimposing two things um, onto a plan, onto an understanding. By a plan, I mean a strategy of work. Um, is a reflection of growing dissatisfaction on my part with architecture as a stabilizing element. In any case, I sort of, not much after I began the book, The Architecture of Exile, um, was commissioned to a synagogue. And uh, as you'll see, I saw it in a very different way than one normally sees a synagogue. Because a synagogue describes a certain time frame from the point of Christ on forward, as opposed to the temples of the Jews, which this book is largely about, um, is from the point of Christ on back. Um, this is the plan. These are several reconstructions of the Temple of Solomon. Um, and the Temple of Solomon has always interested me because, as I get at in some depth in the book, it is always, uh, as George Steiner wrote about it, I think brilliantly, in Salamagundi, the um, Skidmore College in upstate New York's scholarly journal uh, of two and a half years ago, that the Davidic and Solomonic edifice may have been um, an erratum, a misreading um, of the transcendent mobility of the text. In other words, the Torah, the, what is called, known as the Old Testament, um, is a text that was in a constant state of interpretation. And with the coming of the temple, that is, of the fixing of a text whose reading is, is a reflection of a dialogue between humankind and God into a fixed object creates a kind of controversy. So on the one hand, however, there is the temple plan, which you see. Uh, it is always oriented to the east. It's always marked or signed by two columns. They are named, which is in and of itself curious. They're called Yaakim and Boaz. It's all described textually, of course, as you know, in 1 Kings 5 through 9. It, it relates in some way to the Temple of amon Re, if one uh, remembers the um, journey in Exodus and what baggage, cultural and otherwise, the Jews may have carried with them, so that the elevation of the, the east elevation, because it also is oriented to the east, it was all sun culture uh, uh, at that time, of the two obelisks and the two columns, here mistakenly drawn there, described as bipartite, not tripartite in the text, but nonetheless that they sign or mark uh, something beyond, which in turn is reduced in, as a center, so that the side elements, almost as reinforcing flanking elements, the secular sections of the temple, uh, 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 certainly of the temple of the Jews, um, is, is marked in a way that supports the semiotic appearance of those two columns or obelisks. After the time of Christ, of course, the other uh, building type in which uh, uh, the religion was pursued was the synagogue, which is very different from the temple, if for no other reason than its orientation. Whereas the temple always faced east in anticipation of a messianic age, the synagogue, um, in distancing itself from that imminence, uh, always is oriented toward Jerusalem. So these are examples from Carol Krinsky's recent books on Eastern European synagogues. In any case, this congregation came to me 
um, they had purchased a log lodge north of Chicago. And it interested me because it was oriented to Jerusalem. And so I, these, these are pictures of the outside. The inside was also extremely interesting. It was fully log chinked and uh, a great hall in the center. And so it seemed like an, a, a, a terrific space in terms of worship. Uh, so what I did was to superimpose the plan of the log lodge, in a way, uh, uh, sort of entrap it, in a way, by the first floor in scale of the temple, with the two columns evacuated. One remembers the uh, Herod's compromise with the Romans and the appearance of the eagle and the tympanum above the uh, uh, Herod's temple, and removing the, the uh, capitals, which is, a, which is a key thing to do, because the, uh, uh, the capitals, one of the major interpretations of the columns is as flaming crescents, as guiding lights through the desert, uh, that the temple looked back to the mosaic time to mimetically, as the text, which is also mimetic in its continuous interpretation, sort of infers. So removing it and then evacuating it and then having the columns so organized they are at the right dimension per the plan that they posit a blockage in terms of the synagogue was all part of the intentionality. This is the first story on either side of, of the flanking sections of the uh, uh, temple with uh, what appears like scaffolding. Of course, it's trillage and used for the Jewish holiday sukkahs above, but it is, of course, scaffolding as well in anticipation of its, of its completion. So it contains the classrooms, the, the more secular sides, the educational side, the interpretive side, and the uh, 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 um, sacred space is the center. This is the model. That's the orientation. Um, so more and more measurement you may see well, in the in the in the in the synagogue thing, the 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 break between the 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 synagogue section and the temple section was done as a grid, which was also the same cubit. About that same time, four years ago, I uh, was asked to do a very little project, which had a terrific impact, perhaps even on doing this book, certainly on doing the synagogue, certainly on doing the next project that you'll see, and on several things in the Deutsches Architecture Museum, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, done by uh, Matthias Ungers, uh, its director, Juan Heinrich Klotz, asked a number of architects to do a, a niche. There, there are 10 niche uh, on the side away from the mine. Um, and they, he asked 10 architects to do um, a sort of tableau. These are very little spaces. They're five by 10 feet, they're nine feet high. These are the working drawings that we did. Um, and the tableau was to concern itself with man's original house. Um, this kind of Rick Wordian uh, on Adam's house in paradise reflection, this looking backwards once again to see from whence we came. And after a number of false starts, I, was, I had a very difficult time with this. I had incidentally picked um, uh, a niche that happened to have two immense trees in it, making it basically unbuildable. Um, and so I really had a, a terrible time with it. I finally decided simply to measure it. That is to say, to orient a grid which was based on the cubit uh, toward Jerusalem and to simply measure the space three-dimensionally as if it were a kind of three-dimensional soloit and that where it was broken, it would be red, it would be a black grid, it would appear to entrap the trees. In fact, it would disintegrate. It was always held back from the trees, a dimension by which uh, it would not interfere with the tree's growth or any of its limbs, yet alone the trunk. So that the grid disintegrated. And it was the idea underpinning it, I suppose, was that um, uh, man always fails, that nature ultimately prevails, and that the, all that is left is the speculation about measurement, and ultimately that too fails. Um, 
But it was a very interesting project for me to work on. Um, and it was built, and it's still there. I went, uh, there's a show that uh, I'm doing the installation of in Chicago for the Art Institute on Chicago architecture from the time of the fire to the 22 Tribune competition. And it, but it had two openings in Europe, one at the Musée d'Orsay first, and then at the Deutsche Architecture Museum before it came back. And this, so I was there recently, and the, this piece is still there. So it infected, even in ways, some of the projects that one gets, you know, you'd think, well, they're sort of cast-offs. I mean, you do them or you don't do them. But if you do them, somehow they get away from, from you. Uh, and they do with me, too. But having done that, we got a very little project, which I found really interesting. Um, it was for the Formica Corporation, uh, and it was their showroom at the Merchandise Mart in Chicago every year, about this time, actually. There's a thing in Chicago, a convention called Neocon, which is mostly for interiors people that focuses on furniture and furnishings and all that crap. And so they, this showroom had been done the year before by my very old friend Tom Beebe, now the dean at Yale, but from Chicago. And he had done a brilliant tableau, a sort of tour de force of a portion of a Greek stoa, all in Formica. It was very beautifully done. But it, and it was faithful, curiously, for all of its feigning to be something else, of course. It was faithful to that attitude that prevails in, with all architects, that you never really see a thing for what it is. You see it only in metaphorical terms. So formica is never thought of as a material, a plastic laminate, melamine. Um, it's seen for what it can do for you, her, it, the clients, us. Um, that it's a, a lectern, it's a uh, countertop, but it's never intrinsically itself. It never addresses the issue of itself. And, and Bibi had done a brilliant project, I thought, simply by simply accepting those tenets. And so having seen it, the question is, what would one do? And I had just come out of the Berlin thing, uh, uh, the Frankfurt thing, rather. And I decided to try. I, I think this doesn't quite do. I think it sort of fails. But I tried to do a project that would remove its metaphorical posturing and not think of the material in its use, but to try to remove that attitude about the material. So with that in mind, Chicago, as you know, is essentially a grid. It's a city that burned down. It has no memory. Um, its plank roads were, de everything was destroyed. And the only, just about, the only opportunity that one sees something idiosyncratic as opposed to London, which is steeped in its, or mired in its memory. Chicago has none. It is a complete amnesiac as a place, except where natural forces, the Chicago River, for example, the lakefront, whatever, make their appearance. And it's only at those points that buildings become mildly idiosyncratic. This is the merchandise mart. It is, of course, uh, uh, rectilinear, but become, becoming trapezoidal as a product simply of eking out every square foot, which I'm sure is what the architects had on their mind when they did it. This is its floor plate. Uh, if you superimpose the Cartesian grid with this, the one that informs its trapezoidal characteristics, and superimpose that on this itsy bitsy 20 by 26 foot showroom, you get a plan that's like that. And if that plan is gridded, turns out to be a cubit, coincidentally, of black formica and then superimposed by a diagonal grid of white formica, and then you break your way through it, or wend your way through it, um, and at that point certain things happen, as you'll see, that becomes the plan, and that becomes the elevation. And this becomes the object that holds the samples, and that's the three-dimensional drawing of the cubic space with the straightaway Cartesian grid, and the one at uh, 1.414, the white one. So three-dimensionally, that's the matrix that's formed by those grids. There they are both in plan and in elevation. And there they are in plan and elevation after you've ruptured your way through them, and then axonometrically as well. And there it is. Um, and where you do break through, 
um, you get these itsy bitsy samples of the different formica, which of course they love because of the subliminal implications of uh, um, hyping their latest product um, so that all those little awful wood grain formica pieces and things are there as you work your way through this piece. But even then, it is still symmetrical. It is a plan that is ruptured and disrupted and still, but what it's rupturing is that anthropomorphism, which I have tried unsuccessfully to overcome. So when you start breaking buildings apart, you also begin to understand that the break is something that has a kinetic impl implication because it's, it's kinesthetically driven. It's not, it, it removes the static quality of building. This is a house that we're currently working out on, uh, and this is an early study model. I have no drawings of it, but it's a house that, that as it pulls itself apart, uh, it, the implication is it never goes back together in the same way, though it tries to do it. It's made up of, it's, a, it's actually a very simple house. Um, it's made up of three elements that are in the process of unbecoming. Um, they f are, they're a double square in plan. Each of them forms a cube or implies a cube or seeks out to touch the edge of the cube. The conventional gable form and the inverted gable form, um, which shows up in all three, uh, which is then reached by this bar that connects the three. So the house is rotationally in the process of removing itself from itself and leaving the mark or the trace of itself on the old building as it pulls apart. Right, so this perhaps shows it more cleanly. And there's a hinge piece here that helps to make it understandable. It also gets you access to the piece that's being pulled apart. So this is the bedroom wing. Uh, the library and entrance piece, and dining kitchen and living. And then we're doing more pieces in nature. This is a pool and tennis court, of course, etc. But, and these are not very successful right now. They have to be worked on. They're utterly too conventional. In any case, the pieces, as they're being pulled apart, begin to re reveal the nature of what these things are made out of, which is a part of my interest, this business of of attempting to express how something is made actually by pulling it apart at the same time as disrupting the um, consciously the, uh, the concept of a building in its wholeness. This is for Shakespearean comic relief. This is, um, what is it called? A lifeguard tower for a handicapped lifeguard. Um, there's an exhibition in L.A., of course it would be in L.A., this summer of a number of architects doing lifeguard towers, and we're one, and we decided to do one for a handicapped lifeguard, so that the piece that attaches it to the land that's actually in the water is very similar to the wheelchair itself. Um, but even here, the issue of, the, the, of it, the kinetic implications of a building that pulls apart, that do you gain access to only by having an element that gets you out onto it, the kinetic implications of something that is otherwise holistically conceived is what is at the root of this kind of a project. So I did that book, and the book um, is a very unhappy book. The book does not have a happy ending, The Architecture of Exile. And it caused me to work on a response to it, which I'm currently working on, which is the next book, which is called Failed Attempts at Healing an Irreparable Wound. That is, it is almost, it's based on an architectural interpretation of what Harold Bloom uh, calls the Lurianic version of the Kabbalah, the tripartite version of creation, 
where the first part uh, it addresses God's withdrawal, uh, allowing humankind to enter in. Um, the second, uh, the breaking of the vessels, or the apocal an apocalyptic vision of creation. And the third one, of which there's a not very good scholarly journal in New York named after it called Tikkun in Hebrew, which is the um, uh, man's attempt, humankind's attempt at reconstitution, a failed attempt to heal an irreparable wound, so to speak. And I see, and beginning to come to see architecture in that way. And so my work, like all architects, whether they admit it or not, is informed by who they are and what they are at the moment that they do work, and I'm no different. This is a project um, that deals with that subject that we're working on currently. It is an energy museum. It's for the same, um, ener for the same, um, what do you call it, utility people that we did that substation for. This is a plat. This is an amazing coincidence, as you'll see. You won't believe it, but it's true. Um, this is a plat done in 1902 of the city of Zion, Illinois. It exists. It is halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee on the western shores of Lake Michigan. It was put together by one Reverend Dowie, an, evangel an evangelical minister, who, uh, with his flock, settled in Zion um, and uh, produced a great park called Shiloh Park in the center, uh, with all roads leading toward um, a tabernacle, a huge tabernacle since burned down, that occupied the center of the park. All of the streets are either you can almost see it, are almost, uh, are all either, the ones that go east-west, this is Lake Michigan, are, are numbered, and the other ones are the biblical names, Ezra, Ezekiel, Gilbo, Gideon, and so forth. In any case, it didn't work. Um, Chicago became somewhat more sophisticated very quickly. The first war came, the fall from grace. There, the apocalyptic vision of a Baptist fundamentalist view, while still holding sway, throughout much of the central part of the United States, it does not occur in its big cities nearly as much, uh, largely by virtue of the presence of an emigrating population uh, that had other attitudes and, were, and frankly were largely Catholic. So it didn't work, and over the years, they sold off this piece of land, and they kept Zion itself. Now, here's the, here's the map that shows where it is. Um, if this is our drawing of the site, if you, and this is Zion, if you draw a line connecting the center of Shiloh Park with Jerusalem, and you put the two columns of the temple right there, what you will have is a nuclear reactor, okay? which is right there. Now, I know that you don't believe that, but it's actually true. Um, and going back a slide, we then were asked to do this energy museum, and we chose to reorient it to due east, not toward that orientation and to mark it by canals and by trees that emanated from the center. And that all you would see is a very narrow, 40-foot wide basilica facade that uh, what would actually be the sign of a building 450 feet long that would head due east. And we then in turn ruptured that building, as you'll see at a larger scale, uh, in a certain way, forming it into three parts. That's the plan. Um, and this is the elevation from the south, the lake is to the right, and the longitudinal section. So this is the ground plan. The, but by, 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 by cleaving the building at those points, that aligns it with the turbine of this immense operation to the south. And firstly, we change the landscaping. These are conifers, they're white pines. These are red maples, so that in the fall they die and they turn red, um, and then they go back to conifers again. 
Um, they are the secondary emergency egress, of course. It breaks the building into three parts. The dumb part, of, which is the, the part that is building as we know it, that is the conventional building. My basic argument with people like Peter Eisenman is that in, while I concur utterly in, the, in, in, dis, in, in attitudes about dislocation and the necessity, if for no other reason than to reflect an understanding of where and who we are today, or are not, um, I've, I've always felt there has to be something to disintegrate. So the conventional building is the thing that you disintegrate. A building like this that makes its presence understood by its detail, its convention in the best sense as well as the worst sense, in its reference and thus in its deference to another time. Uh, and so that's what this first part of the building is. It is just an industrial shed, but its trusses are mute. That is, moment is the, the moment connect connections are not expressed. They're taken by welds. It is entirely suppressed. It's a conventional building. You don't see the source of its energy. You don't see its conduits, its ducts. You see the, uh, the tips of those icebergs, the, as you see in building, the duplex receptacles, the registers, the things that you see in buildings. Um, and so that's what the first portion is. It's a, a steel-clad building. The concrete is hand-rubbed. The steel is flush panels. Etc. There is no detailing. It is made mute. It is a building. It is then disrupted. It is, and this is the exhibit section, beginning with the quest for fire and running through about the whole business of energy, and not just electric energy. It's not just Tom Edison. Um, and its orientation, of course, is back to the nuclear reactor. And if from that point on to here, the building is entirely r ruptured, where we're in the working drawings right now, I have no slides to show it, um, where the detail is now expressed, where now the trusses are double angle trusses with the very expressive and exaggerated, in size at least, and form, uh, gusset plates, where the conduits suddenly appear and service the duplex receptacles, etc., which you then see, of course, um, where the ducts suddenly appear, where the siding is expressive, it's another kind of siding, where, the, uh, 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 where stainless steel ties in the f footings and so forth. It is a way of expressing the building. And the third portion attempts to put it back together again and fails, where now the walls begin to cover, but don't completely cover the ducting and the conduits, et cetera, et cetera. So that building is... Uh, for me, a great excitement at the moment. This is the building, looking at it, the canals, which are here. This is looking at the western section leading to the lake, um, the, the trees, and you can perhaps see the slight change in color. Maybe it shows better in other slides, in another slide, rather, in the ramp that goes up to the entrance itself, and then the cleavage at that point, whereas here you can see that in the same way. So this is from the lake, and those two points of rupture. Um, and the, it's a very, from an, it's from a, a display, because it's really, a, it's a museum, it's an exhibition place. So you go through the, all of this stuff in the exhibition, and then finally you come to a hall like this, which is facing east, and you see slides of whatever these people show, and then, I've persuaded them that it only occurs in the morning, the, the lectures. And then the screen goes up, and the sun is blazing through in the horizon and the canals leading into the lake. This is a project of, of a part of an exhibition that, we're, that we did, that, that will be come up, I guess, in September in Berlin. You know, we did that project in Berlin, so I have been going back and forth. And there is an exhibition that is just happening now um, about the Berlin Wall. And uh, they've asked a number of architects to make proposals about the wall. And um, I was one. And I, Berlin is, a, is an incredible city because of the existence of a physical condition that disrupts the, the city and causes in an agitated way, a new understanding of a city as a thing of disruption, as opposed to a city 
of cohesion, a city, as opposed to a city that has a center, a city that has no center, but obviously yearns for its center by taking the wall down. My proposal, and the wall, of course, is an incredible element itself because um, of the kind of somewhat evil energy that it creates through this dislocative act. Um, my idea is not, and the, and the wall is interesting because it's not a wall, it's two sides of a coin. On the, on the west side, it, the, the wall facing west, Berlin, has been so graffitied that it's basically uh, all color, it's gray. The other side is the absence of color, it's completely white. Um, so my idea is not to take the wall down, but to leave the wall and to create a linear park, a sort of park of memory with two LA, one on either side of the wall created by four rows of trees and a canal, which is the only thing that joins and ways of getting through uh, that are very strange, which I'll show you. This is a drawing that I made early on of my understanding of Berlin and its orientation in the west and the east, its biblical ramifications, etc. So this is a section blown up that we drew at um, uh, the Brandenburg Gate. And this is the wall, uh, the portion of the wall, or details of it to begin to show what's happening. So the part that you walk across, which occurs at, at all of the streets, that these points, which shows up in the model and occurs, well, they don't, well it occurs here, sorry, and here, and wherever a street occurs. And this is the only way that cars get through at the Brandenburg Gate. Um, the, th that you would go through here, these are steel plates, this piece, with uh, steel treads, open riser, but the steel plate which runs across, because your feet only reach this point to go across the wall, and then single file. Um, so you never see laterally. The only place that it co-joins is the, the place where the wall is broken, where the canal comes through, and you can't quite see it sitting on these benches which have the, um, the uh, symbol um, in characters of what that means. So these are model slides of the, of the wall. That the wall is here. It's a, it's a clay gravel uh, um, linear park with these benches running along and the four rows of plane trees, sycamore trees. This is the last project I'm going to show. Um, in that same spirit of failed attempts of healing an irreparable wound, we're doing a project alongside of one and simultaneous to one being done by Michael Graves in uh, Fukuoka City in the South Island Kyushu of Japan. Um, and it's a six-story housing project. And what we've done, these are study slides of a study model, but I wanted to share them with you. Um, uh, what is in the center of this, which you can't see, um, is impenetrable, is a, uh, is, a, is, is a perfect cube that is marked, that is divided and made measurable because of a grid, which is a, my attempt at, a, at, a, at an ideal garden that is reachable only by the tenants. There's also retail on the ground floor of this, but it's only accessible to the people inside the building. So the building forms as sort of an atrium, a light cord, I suppose. And then within the light cord, compressed at the bottom, there is this cube. And around the cube is housing, um, which this only schematically shows that will be in color, that will be done per the varying needs of the plan as rationalized by the architect in order to achieve a sort of apocalyptic vision of the profane activities of housing and then a failed attempt at reconvening that grid that doesn't meet and that disintegrates on the other side that you can't see, which is the, to meet the sun angle 
uh, business. You can see the, that grid on there. It begins to disintegrate going down. You can't see it. It's on the other side. Um, so this attempt, this failed attempt to reconvene with, through measurability of something that doesn't pull itself back together is another way I'm trying to get at, at this subject. What was interesting when I put these slides together to bring them to London, I, you know, because you have, one has one slides around one in these boxes with trays and drawers and stuff, and I was going through this, and I happened to go back because I was showing, I wanted to show a few examples of work I'd done earlier. Um, I uh, showed, I happened to go through them, and I happened to come across my bachelor's thesis in architecture school at Yale uh, about 29 years ago. It was very interesting to see through all of this um, that there it was, um, or at least that section of this project in Fukuoka that dealt with the housing, per se, bereft of these other... Th so it's taken me basically three decades to do nothing to accept to come to a point of an understanding about something of which this then is only a part, which is interesting, I guess. So that's the last slide. These are slides I just wanted to show some of this, of these other things that we do in the office, these bizarre little objects, these architectural tchotchkes. Um, this is a tea service that we did for Alessi, which is uh, a superimposed uh, platonic, series of platonic solids, spheres, cylinders, and so forth, superimposed by body parts, hair, lips, hands, etc. The Italians have an interesting way of cleaning up one's act. It was originally done in flesh color, but they thought it was more marketable, I guess, to turn it in, to, to sort of launder it, to turn it into a more reasonable looking series of objects. These are rocking chairs that we did for Knoll International. Um, architects design. Um, these are dresses now probably walking around the streets of Osaka um, of fabric uh, patterns that I designed. Uh, this is somewhat humorous. Uh, there's an awful chair in the United States that's incredibly comfortable called a barca lounger or a lazy boy. It's a chair that you push a button like in an airplane and it goes back and the thing that your feet can stretch out on come up underneath. And they asked me to do one, so of course I did three, an ionic, uh, a, 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 ionic a Doric, and a Corinthian barca lounger, which ended up looking more like a koala bear than anything. Um, <laughs> Naturally, it wasn't built. Um, the, the Formica chaise longue, uh, which was in an exhibition here, actually, <clears throat> is for two people reasonably intimately disposed so that they, such that they read opposite sides of the same page of the New York Times simultaneously. <laughs> a screen that doesn't. Um, a chair for Herman M Miller that was somewhat erectile, uh, or that would become so at, to, to form a place to put your feet, and fingers and toes, things to play with. Um, a tea service that looked curiously like our weekend house, a salt and pepper shaker, um, dinnerware, jewelry, a um, piece for the Mardi Gras in Galveston on the left as a piece of street furniture under which the Mardi Gras went. Um, two towers in an Arcadian setting um, for the couple that had everything, I suppose. Um, that's it. Thank you very much.
I was wondering how you uh, relate to Peter Eisenman's thoughts that architecture happens in a diaspora, which is something uh, you tend to uh, come upon in your talking. Um, I don't know about that. I, um, he and I have continuing discussions, often debates about that. He actually uh, did an early editing for content of the book, The Architecture of Exile. I don't know that it occurs in a diaspora. Um, I think um, architecture is uh, complicated when seen in the light of the Second Commandment, that is, the figural issue. I think that um, it does make it difficult to produce an architecture if your beliefs are such that agonize about the issues of figuration, let's say. Now, I don't know whether that, I don't think that's what Peter really means by that. Um, I think that what Peter means, in, uh, that architecture occurs in a diaspora, um, is a way of reinforcing his views about dislocationality. Uh, and without accusing him in his absence of exploiting uh, the conditions of a diaspora to rationalize dislocationality, I suspect that that's a good part of it. Um, to a degree, I agree with it. Um, I, I think that, you know, my feeling is this, uh, which is why I'm at work on this other book. On the one hand, it strikes me that it is preposterous, and this is where I do conform and concur with his views about this subject. It is preposterous to only look over one's shoulder to, for antecedent verification. There is a certain nostalgia implicit in continuously seeking uh, authentication about what you do through the use of, of antecedents to uh, rationalized to justify what one does. It is, however, a conventional operation, and it certainly is in the context of the conventions of architecture to operate that way. I agree that that's preposterous. I think it's equally preposterous, and this is where Eisenman and I have a, 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 the, the, the debate gets sharpened somewhat. I think it's equally preposterous to, um, uh, to deconstruct, to dissemble in and of itself, which is the second phase, the sort of apocalyptic vision or version of creation, the breaking of the vessel, so to speak, to paraphrase the, uh, uh, the Lurianic version of the Kabbalah. And that's where this failed third attempt. I think there is something intrinsically optimistic about architecture. Now, Eisenman is very strong in his language in support of the grotesque from arabesque which he talks about at some length. Um, and I have a real problem with that, because I think to be an architect is to have a vision, is to attempt to get it right, is to attempt to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. I don't think it can happen, but I am not so cynical, even at my age and weight, not to yet continue to try. I really, truly believe that if you're going to be an architect, that it is your obligation to try to get it right. I don't think you ever can. But I, I think that until and unless you try, I think it's preposterous. I think that there is, you know, what is the point? I mean, th then why have children? Why breed? Why hybridize? Why try to make a better flower? Why try to do anything? I think the dislocationality and the grotesque condition, which is in us all, which is in all children, it is in nations, it is in everything we know, in our history, in all of the world's history. Not to know it is silly, to pretend it doesn't do exist. To pretend to infer that it doesn't exist is preposterous. I think that just to do classical architecture is preposterous, in my view. To deny uh, 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 the, the construct that infers that we try to put it back together is equally preposterous. I think that that's wrong myself. You see, when I say wrong, of course then the issue of morality enters in. Now, we had a conference, it's coming out as a book, 
on deconstruction in Chicago that I moderated, that Eisenman was at, that Mark Taylor, the brilliant theologian from Williams was at, and a wonderful woman named Susan Handelman, um, who is also involved in, as a complete person in deconstruction. And she, as a good friend of Mark Taylor, Mark was talking about denomination, the taking away of a name his fascination with the removal of names. Um, and she said to Mark, you know, Mark, that's your problem. Um, I, as a Jew, don't have the luxury of denomination. I am bound to a kind of morality. Now, you can ask the question, whose morality? But I think that architecture is also a moral act. When you hear people like Kevin Roach in accepting the Pritzker Prize four years ago, I guess, um, saying that architecture is an act of peace, which I was stunned by. Um, and you read a little Heidegger about Bowen builded building, the sort of linguistic return to dwelling or being or existing in peace. There is a moral implication. I mean, it's a reflection of my sincerity, I grant you. Um, but there is a moral implication in such a view of the world. And I think that to, you know, in a post diaspora sense to infer that architecture um, operates just in that condition only reinforces Peter's view of the apocalyptic vision without return or resolution. I find it morally despicable in a word. And I have said it to him, absolutely. We have this terrific argument about that. Because I think in the end, architecture is an attempt to write it. That is W-R-I-E-T-E, -E, as well as R-I-G-H-T. And when you write it, you are, by, you are by definition morally engaged as you are mimetically engaged. And that's the problem, because writing infers rewriting. Both spellings work. Um, and mimesis goes against the grain of an understanding of the dislocation of the day of which Peter Eisenman is correct in bringing to a conscious level. I concur with that entirely. But the issue is one, I mean, Eisenman, I continuously accuse of pulling off scabs of architecture, right, and causing fresh pain and new blood, right? I'm more interested in healing the wound but not healing the wound. I was going to show some slides now, I didn't do it, it was probably a mistake, of some recent student work that's actually quite brilliant in this. Students of mine have been working with me on the subject of trying to do a building almost as trying to uh, suture a wound, that the building is a suture, but you still read the scar. In other words, you cannot heal that scar. That scar whether it's from a biblical myth that begins as a confrontation with God at Eden, or it begins culturally, you can do it in any number of ways you like, but you may not heal the scar. To pretend that the scar doesn't exist is preposterous, which is the view of looking backwards over your shoulder. Uh, so you, you believe then that your architecture happens in a relative time and that it can never happen in absolute time? Yeah, that's right. This gentleman had a question. Yes. I was just going to congratulate you, Stanley, from all the years you have been working, way back since the early 60s, how you've managed to keep the humor, the combination of humor and measurement, which you've talked about this evening. And I think that through all the things you've been exploring, uh, your, I, I, I don't know whether it's intentional, but I suspect it is in many ways, to try to make people smile, uh, it makes me smile with pleasure. And I think how you can actually get that from the combination of measurement, I think, is, uh, is, is fascinating to me. Just to thank you. Thank you. Yes. Something I didn't quite understand in your, um, in your introduction to the slides, I admit to my own ignorance, I think, was um, a, a summation of, um, I think, two current trends in architecture at the moment, where you mentioned something about France and um, maybe about postmodernism, but I lost it. I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Um, it is really between representation and abstraction. And 
in architecture the desire to uh, engage in mimetic acts to repeat things from the past in order to verify existence is a natural behavior in architects as far as I'm concerned and on the one hand but within the context of what I just answered to the young man who posed the question in the back on the other hand is the desire to toward abstraction there is an abstract you know, architecture um, is this strange melding or this uneasy merging of two very disparate attitudes, one that makes it representational. You understand it. It's gravity-based. Yet you don't understand it unless it, like a metaphor, as in Venturi's first uh, book, The Understanding of a Brown Derby, The Duck and the Decorated Shed, um, the, the attitude about, actually the second book, the attitude about understanding a building on the one hand, but then on the other hand, it being abstracted. There is a drive toward abstraction, as a working architect well knows. It is couched, as far as I'm concerned, in measurement. But when you, because when you strip everything away, all that you have left is your ability, as a cartographer does, is to simply measure. And measurability is not something to be casual about, because measurement is your way of interrelating with something by which you may appear to possess it. It's like nomination, uh, when in the Garden of Eden the animals were named. It is a way of owning Spot and Fido, of calling, of giving a children a first name. Um, and that nomination is, is an act that gives them propriety, that deals with property, that deals with all of the things of, the, of legitimacy. So measurement is not lightly taken for me. It is also a way of making, of communicating, of making things uh, communicable, of un making them understandable. When you make a building out of bricks, if you know the size of a brick, you could just simply count them, you or any person on the street, and you know the size of the building. If you know the size of the building, you can translate it into so many meters or feet by so many meters or feet, or cubits, you own it because you can recall it and you know its size you know its relativist position in the world okay so measurement is a very interesting thing it is utterly ultimately abstract as a thought not at its result now all of that opposed to the romantic nostalgic desire to return to an original which is couched in mimesis, which in architecture is a way of regurgitating for authentic, authentication purposes, earlier forms, antecedents, so to speak. It verifies what, you, what, you do, what we do, okay? So this debate goes on between these things, between abstraction, in a word, between an understanding about dislocation um, and ideas about centrism, ideas about our being at the center of the world as we know it, and controlling that by acts of verification. That's what I was trying to get to. And this work, which is the work of a confused person, a schizophrenic, of a, 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 an exilic type of an American, right? A person who doesn't, who's not even destined to return to the soil to which he is biblically assigned, because it's not his, okay? Um, is what interests me. French structuralist thought, after which, uh, and post-structuralist thought, much of the interest, recent interest with architects, and myself included, about uh, 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 deconstruction, about post-structuralist thinking, led by singularly Jacques Derrida, um, does in fact, and does make somewhat clear, um, issues of dislocationality, certainly. So that's the debate. And it's being sharpened continuously. One down up front. Thank you. Um, earlier on, you said you didn't want to pull Humpty um, Dumpty uh, apart, but you um, you discussed a couple of projects in which you did build um, pull buildings apart. How do you justify that? Yeah, it was on my way. If, if, certainly, you're you're correct in your observation. 
the, this work has been a kind of evolving work. It's a work that is now trying to understand how to put it back together. Um, but it was a work that tried to take it apart first, certainly. Um, and, but in order to take it apart, there had to be something to take apart. I mean, let me put it another way. Um, I'm, among the other things I do, I'm also the director of the School of Architecture at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And um, among the things that we do is to have um, people like Alan Greenberg, our version of Quinlan Terry, um, teach at the school, and many others like him, as well as teach the classical language by the book canonically, Vitruvian. And at the same time, we have Peter Eisenman, Jeff Kipnis, and others teaching, in a way, deconstruction, pulling the work apart. Um, I have always been of the belief that there is, and my problem is therein, is that I've always believed that there is something that does exist, which is the buildup of language. I also believe in the dislocationality of this particular epoch and the, mm -hmm. and the way of expressing that by pulling it apart. But I now realize that there is an intention, which is this innate optimism, which I think does inhabit the heart of every architect, to try to put it back together by pretending that neither there was an original nor that it was pulled apart is silly, it seems to me. By just building and not pulling it apart is silly. By pulling it apart and not having something to pull apart is silly. I think all those things exist. There is a history. It did occur. It exists. Okay? It is not just in memory. Just to replicate it is ridiculous. But, just, but not to, to understand that it was there or to dismiss it out of hand, equally ridiculous. So the, you know, it's not, I, did, you know, I wasn't born understanding those things. I certainly didn't understand them when I came out of architecture school. I didn't understand them 10 years ago. Um, it, it takes, at least in my case, it has taken some time to understand these things. But you're right in observing them. Well, thank you very much. But before you say it, Yes, you have a question. I, I don't have a question, no. I, I just wanted to say thank you. And, you know, I think it's amazing when, um, when you showed the Formica showroom, it could have been a city, could have been a child's toy, and it was extraordinary, and one suddenly felt an electricity in the room. And you used a phrase at the start, um, where you said, architect of a stripe. And I was thinking that really, I mean, in this evening, you know, and one is very grateful to, to Red and Bricks and the Roof Tile Company, you know, for, do, for getting you here, because we at the RIBA are so poor, we couldn't possibly afford you. <laughs> we really couldn't. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> yeah, you can't, <laughs> you can't rent this out for much. Um, that you're an architect of a stripe who enjoys language. And apart from the delicious, uh, I thought absolutely wonderful coincidence of the King's Cross pictures, which made it all seem like we planned it with British Rail Property Board a year ago. You should be here. I thought the one thing that came, off, that came across to me was that, A, you're the architect of a stripe who enjoys language, and that means that you like playing with things, but that also means me you like thinking. Thank you very much, Stanley. It's been great. Thank you, Dan.